Okay, I'd like to thank everybody that's here live and also everyone that's online. We will be recording this uh, for any friends or family that want to see it later. And we appreciate your coming out and joining us with Don Conley today. Uh, it was a very interesting day, but not unusual. Now, if we go back, if you've read the book, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, Dickens wrote it was the best of times, it's the worst of times. It's the age of wisdom, it's the age of foolishness, it's the epoch of belief, and the epoch of incredulity, which really could describe what's happening right now. And in fact, that was written uh, more than 100 years ago in 1859. So right now we have a lot of challenges. Frankly, there's quite a few opportunities that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And then Don's going to give some insight into what's happened over the last 50 years or so, which clearly is very, very timely. As a team, we've always been committed to helping our clients and our community. And one of those things that we've been doing is what's called Carver Cares. Uh, we do I want to thank everybody because with your help, over the last 30 years, we've been able to donate more than $285,000 to local charities. And we've also been able to donate more than 130,000 pounds of food uh, to people in our county. Today's Carver Cares event is the Lane County Emergency Management Agency. And uh, you can learn more about them on our website or go to the web their website. As always, any donations that are made in the next 30 days will match up to uh, $4,000. So, clearly the media, as we've said over the last 30 years, is pretty much negative and always focused on the short term. This quote from Newsweek is pretty telling. The economy is moving and Americans travel in prosperity after bouncing back from a recession although not everybody's participating. Advancements in technology are changing the way we live, and there's hope that the new century will bring even more progress, and anxiety lurks beneath the New Year's optimism. Will these new technologies change the world beyond recognition? Has the environment been dangerously damaged? A global epidemic's raging, but no cure in sight, and the business world, the public wavers about whether to admire or hate a tycoon who somehow gained control of one of the most important economic engines of the century. The thing is, they wrote this almost 100 years ago in 1899, actually 120 years ago. The epidemic was polio. The technology was the Industrial Revolution, not Facebook or Twitter or the Internet. And the tycoon was Rockefeller. It was not uh, Donald Trump. So why does it feel like things are getting worse? And a lot of it, as we say, is just how the media is. It's important to understand the business of the news media is not to inform, but it's to sell advertising. So whether they lean to the left or to the right or to the center, the goal is to attract readers or viewers. And to do so, they focus on the sensational in the short term. And if you look today, there's 8,500 magazines 1,761 commercial TV stations and more than 192 websites competing, not to mention the blogs and all the other stuff. Back in 1987, the last time we had a drop like today, there were three TV stations, CBS, NBC, and ABC. And really, you, you were lucky if you got a 401k statement once a year, and then you got a newspaper once in a while. So. If you look at the headlines, Dow plunges a thousand points over coronavirus fears. <laughs> Dow falls the most in history. Dow plunges, bringing its decline to, from a record high to more than 10% down. All of these things sound like, like once in a lifetime events. And yet if we look back, typically the market corrects about 5% every two months. And it corrects 10% about every eight months on average. So a 10% correction is really nothing that unusual. And frankly, even 20% happens about every 30 months. If we go back, and this is hard to see, but all the slides are available from our office. 
you email us, we'd be happy to provide copies of any of these charts or slides because they are a little bit tricky to see. But essentially what this shows is even two years ago, in 2018, the market dropped 20%. And yet people kind of forget that. In fact, the average drop for the S&P every year the last 40 years is 14% at some point during the year. So while the dip we saw today <clears throat> is certainly a little bit steeper and faster than what we've seen, it's really not out of the ordinary from what we've seen over the years. If we look at other epidemics going back, whether it's measles, SARS, MERS, etc., you can see every time, excuse me, the market's dipped and then it's come back up to reach a new high. The last three bigger epidemics, the Asian flu, SARS, and H1N1, again, we saw the same pattern we're seeing now, which is a drop of 20 to 30% from peak to drop. And then typically within six months, things have rebounded. In fact, within a year after the Asian flu, the markets, the S&P was up about 35%. Same thing with H1N1. Now, it doesn't guarantee it's going to happen, you know, this time. Uh, and if you look at the last one, <coughs> the SARS epidemic, that was right at the dot-com bubble. So it, it coincided with something else that was happening. But typically, the steeper and the faster the drop, the faster the recovery. People are concerned about the uh, United States and what's happening with the coronavirus. Um, what you can see is, even in October, Johns Hopkins looked at various countries around the world and the United States is the most prepared to deal with any type of epidemic, whether you look at prevention, detection, healthcare, uh, norms, risk, etc. To put it in perspective, from October of last year till today, between 18 and 30,000 people have died from the regular flu in the United States. You know, as of the last we saw, coronavirus had killed 28 people. Not that that's insignificant, but relative to the 3,000 people a month that get killed by car accidents and the people that get killed by regular flu, it's really not that much. I think a lot of this is, is just panic, quite frankly. My daughter lives in Israel, and a lot of people think Israel is super dangerous. You know, there's all these bombs going off and wars. In 2018, in the United States, 80,000 people died from the flu. 26 people died in Israel from war, terrorism, and everything else. So the perception is certainly not in line with the, the reality. Now the problem is nobody has a crystal ball. And if you miss the one or two best days a year, it dramatically impacts what happens. So if we go back 20 years to 1999, and we look and somebody puts $100,000 into the S&P 500, that grew to roughly $324,000. If you missed just the 40 best days a year, the 100,000 went down to 47,000. Or excuse me, 40 best days total, the two best days a year. So if you missed just two days, you actually lost half your money. And if you missed the 60 best days, so the three best days each year, your 100,000 went down to 24,000 and change. We can't time the markets. So we can't predict what's going to be a good day versus a bad day. But what we do know is typically when there's a big negative drop, it's followed by a pretty significant increase. Last week, we saw some of the biggest point drops. We also saw some of the biggest point gains. In 2008, despite being the middle of the Great Recession, seven of the 20 best days in the last half a century happened. So there were quite a few big up days. And again, if you miss those, it's, it, it devastates the returns. So the two questions who I who always ask people are, one, every time the market's gone down in the last 100 plus years, has it come up? Yes. And every time that it's come up, has it reached a new record high? 
Absolutely. So the question is, why don't people, how do people ever lose money? And the answer is, people get out when they're scared at the bottom. And then they jump in when it's going up at the top. And they miss out on those best days along the way. It's been said that the four most dangerous words in investing are this time it's different. Sir John Templeton said that. Because it's not different. That the, the, not only are the events typically the same, even the headlines stay the same. I feel like the cover of Time Magazine will be wearing masks again and we're not ready for the next pandemic. That's from 2009 and 2017. H1N1 and the bird flu, again, 2009 and 2004. So what happens is, like we said, people typically are very enthusiastic at the top. And then as things start to waver, they get scared, they get kind of desperate, and that's usually when there's a, a big opportunity. I would rather get in early than get in late. And we do think, with the volatility we're seeing, it's actually three good opportunities for people today. Number one, obviously you can invest with stuff that's cheaper than it was. But number two, you can reposition money that's sitting in bonds or sitting in cash into equities at lower values. The second opportunity are tax swaps. Stuff that's come down, you can move to something else to stay invested, the same investment, <coughs> but take the write-off on the one that's gone down. And lastly, if you have tax-deferred IRAs, this is a great time to convert them to tax-free Roth IRAs. So from our standpoint, we feel there's only three reasons changes should be made. It's not because the market's up or down, sideways. It's number one, because your needs change. Number two, it's because we need to rebalance. Or number three, it's because there's an issue with a specific investment. The fact of the matter is our process that we've developed and refined holds cash for times like this. That's why we have cash. That's why we have fixed income. And typically why we recommend having six to 12 months of that so we can ride out these periods and or invest uh, at a time like this. The process we use is proactive. If someone's asking themselves, what do I do now? Then it's too late. It's already happened. What you want to do is be proactive in setting up your portfolio, your investments, and your planning to be prepared for times like this. And lastly, it's important to focus on the net return. It's not how much you keep that's important, or excuse me, it's not how much you make that's important, it's how much you keep after fees, expenses, and taxes. So we want to take a very proactive tax minimization approach. And with today's environment, there are opportunities to do some tax offsets. Uh, so, we use a team-based approach. You can speak to anybody in the office, and obviously we're here to support any questions uh, that people have. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We know what history has shown us, and that's what we're going to talk about now to give us an idea. So Don Conley was actually the first speaker we had in 1986. So again, the more things change, the more they kind of remain the same. Um, this is the fourth time he's been kind enough to speak. Don is perhaps the financial industry's most successful storyteller speaker. He has 45 years of experience. He's spoken all over the world, countries ranging from Australia to Korea, to Great Britain, to Canada, to Mexico, the United States. He lectures at various universities such as Harvard, Cambridge, the Wharton School of Business. And today, he's here to talk about the litany of disaster and what's happened over the last 50 years. So, Don. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. We've got the clicker, same clicker. Same clicker. Good evening, everyone, both here and online. Am I standing in the right spot? Um, all I'm going to try to do tonight, briefly, is put this whole thing in perspective. We're so close to the forest, we can't see the trees. Coronavirus is all around us. Every generation looks for reasons not to invest. And coronavirus, if you want a reason not to invest, this is it in the last couple days. Every generation has that. The last generation had a coronavirus. It was called 9-11. I know all of you remember that. 
If you think back, 9-11 was the most unprecedented act in history. It was the most widely watched event in the world. Most, we all saw the second plane hit the building. There was nothing different about coronavirus. There's nothing different about 9-11. 9-11 happened before. Now, I don't take 9-11 lightly. I know that comment tends to strike close to home. I, at the time, was, was Senior Vice President of Marketing for Putnam Investments. Our parent company, the third largest loss of life in the World Trade Center. We lost 295 people that day. So 9-11 is very near and dear to my heart. But it's happened before. My mother's 9-11 was bigger than that, her generation. In my mother's 9-11, only one person died, not 3,000 people. It was a 46-year-old guy from Boston. Very handsome, very charismatic guy. Now, on November 22, 1963, in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, he was shot dead. And America lost some of her soul that day. My mother's mother had a 9-11 bigger than that, and we don't talk about it anymore. My grandparents knew for a fact that on December 7, 1941, the United States was going to be invaded. There was nothing between Hawaii and California except blue water. The Navy was gone. The fear was so palpable. I spoke one night. Anybody ever, ever been to San Diego, to Coronado in San Diego? I spoke at the Dell, the, the famous, famous hotel where Some Like It Hot was filmed. It was, it's a great old hotel. There was a guy in the audience slightly older than me. He was uh, a young kid when Pearl Harbor was attacked. He lived on Coronado in San Diego, most expensive real estate in San Diego. His father was so convinced the Japanese were coming, he sold this guy's father two houses for ten dollars on Coronado Island to get out of town before the Japanese got there. So I asked myself several years ago, how many 9-11s have happened in our lifetime? How do we lend perspective to this whole thing? Now, I was born in 1945. I'm 74 and a half. <laughs> so I started in 1950. It was the first major event of my life. And I'm going to ask you to take a real quick walk down, his, down memory lane with me as we go through um, just a, really a pictorial walk we're going to take. So, Randy said we're getting so much information, we're losing our common sense. We are, that's true. We're trying to take a sip from a fire hose. When you, so let me, I love to be simple, make it as simple as possible. I love to keep things very, very simple. So simply put, when you invest, there are three things at work here. One is risk tolerance. How much risk can you tolerate? That's something you have to figure out, sit down with your advisor. And I caution you, when you finally figure out how much risk you're willing to take, cut it in half. Because the number one rule in this business is you've got to sleep at night. But risk tolerance is with us our whole life. It's not something that changes as we get older. How much risk did you tolerate as a kid? You know, would you ride your bike down, did you skateboard too fast, did you take crazy, crazy chances? Whatever you, did you, do you drive the speed limit? Do you drive 80 miles an hour? That's your risk tolerance. I don't want to talk about that because that can't be changed. I don't want to talk about risk perception. Risk perception is how risky do you think what you're doing right now really is? How, how much is your money at risk right now? Now, our money's at risk in bull markets. We're okay because it's worth it. The rewards are great enough. But I'm not going to change your risk perception. I can't change your risk tolerance. I can't change your perception of risk. What I want to try to change is your recency bias. Recency bias is a term that psychologists use. It's placing an emphasis on the most recent, what we've seen recently. And so when we're in a bull market, like we've been in the last 10 years, well, it's going to go on forever. Now that we're going down, oh, it's going to go on forever. That's recency bias. We forget what happened a little while ago. We tend to focus on the present. If I asked anybody here or listening online, what did you have for lunch yesterday? You could all tell me. If I said, what did you have for lunch? What's today, Thursday? What did you have for lunch Tuesday? Some of you could tell me. What did you have for lunch Monday? Nobody could tell me. What'd you have for I don't know. I don't know what I had last week. Why? Because I don't remember what happened recently. That's what I want to try to change. I want to try to change your recency bias. I want to take a step back from coronavirus, back from this market, and try to put what's going on in perspective. Because the next generation is going to have their coronavirus, and that's, it's going to be some, called something else, but it's going to be 9-11 coronavirus or whatever. So I ask myself, how many, so let, let me just go on a little bit. Alan Abelson from Barron's, who passed away a couple of years ago, he made a great, he had a great analogy one day, one week in Barron's. He said, when you put money in the market, and you watch your prices every single day, it's like walking up a hill playing with a yo-yo and watching the yo-yo, not the hill. Hi, are you gaining ground as you walk up the hill? I don't know. Why don't you know? Because I'm not watching, I'm watching the yo-yo. Well, the yo-yo is the headlines. We've got to get our eyes off the yo-yo and back on the hill. We've got to step back and look at that hill, not just the ups and downs of the yo-yo, not just the headlines. Now, Dow Jones Industrial Average, it's the most widely watched, it's actually an index, it's the most widely watched index in the United States. It's, it's the oldest, one of, not the oldest, one of the oldest. It's not very sexy. It's not, 
It's not, but it's, 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 it's 30 stocks, each stock a very reliable company, and those 30 stocks together represent 70% of the buying power of publicly traded America. Been around since 1896. So when someone says, how did the market do today? They mean, how did the Dow do? It means, how did America do? 30 stocks, Dow Jones Industrial Average. The first major event, I was born in 1945. So I started this little walk down memory lane in 1950. In 1950, the Dow closed at 198.89. First trading day of 1950, January 3rd. The yo-yo went off. Coronavirus is the yo-yo. 9-11 is the yo-yo. Pearl Harbor is the yo-yo. Well, the yo-yo went off in 1950. The Korean War. Let's put that in perspective. World War II casualty figures were not released until June 4, 1963. John Kennedy, at a, a nuclear disarmament treaty, for the first time released the figures. Now, if there are veterans watching or in this room, and I'm sure there are, veterans will tell you men don't go to war, boys go to war. John Kennedy told us for the first time on June 4, 1963, in World War II, the United States lost 500,000 boys killed. Germany, 4 million boys killed. Russia, 20 million boys killed. Half their factories, a third of their homes, gone. The world had had it with war. And all of a sudden, five years later, we're back in it. And the press said, oh, this time it's different. This is not a war, this is a police action. And for the first time, this is communism against democracy. And it was it, 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 600,000 Chinese troops crossed the Yellow River in North Korea, heading for South Korea. So the United States sent troops to South Korea in, in anticipation of that. All of a sudden, we're at a war, a police action. Harry Truman didn't want to call it a war, called it a police action. And 37,000 American boys died in Korea. And the press said, oh, this is different. This is communism versus democracy. This is not like all those other times. Well, it wasn't different. It was one more incident. The Yo-Yo went off again in 1955. Dwight Eisenhower, when, when, when Eisenhower was president, we were the only superpower on Earth. It was, everybody wanted, you know, World War II's over, Korea's over now, everybody wants Ozzy and Harriet's electric, all electric hot point kitchen. America's just buzzing along. And all of a sudden, Eisenhower had a massive heart attack. And there was no embedded press. So he was under wraps. No one knew if he was dead or alive. And the market hated. The market just absolutely crashed until, we figured out, until they figured out what was going on with Eisenhower. That was the yo-yo. The yo-yo went off again in 1955. We're the only superpower on Earth. No other superpower. We woke up one day. The Soviet Union has detonated a fission bomb. It terrified America. You remember, remember your, parents, your parents being terrified. Soviets first tested a hydrogen bomb in 1949. In the early 1950s, this is a fission bomb. And all of a sudden, for the first time in her life, America was frightened, scared to death. So I ask you, what's more significant? The Soviets setting off a fission bomb that can blow up the world, or coronavirus? John Kennedy's death, World War II. We've got to put it all in perspective. Two years later, and that's, that precipitated a bear market. Since 1929, we've had 25 bear markets. Now, I'm going to define a bear market as the Standard & Poor 500 being down 20%. It's happened 25 times since 1929. That's one every 3.4 years. The average decline, 35%. I think now we're, right now we're down 28%. The average duration, 10 months. So, are we, is this coronavirus or are we overdue? We haven't had a bear market since 2008. Had one every 3.4 years since 1929. Now it's been over 10 years. So maybe this is not, maybe this is just nervous investors taking profits and, and coronavirus precipitated that slide. But two years later, after the, setting off a fission bomb, the Soviets launched a satellite. Some of you may remember it was called Sputnik. We used to sit up at night, you could hear it on ham radios, watch it fly overhead. And the Soviets said, we control outer space. America was terrified. We said, my God, what will those, what will those Soviets think of next? They've got fission bombs, satellites in outer space, one of the most terrifying times in American history. We got through it, but the press said, oh, this time it's different. This is a Cold War with fission bombs that could blow up the world. Look what the Dow did in the 1950s. You can do the math. Why? Randy said it. There were only three, there were only three networks. We got, remember, anybody old enough to remember getting 15 minutes of news and nothing but news? And all of a sudden, it's 24 hours a day and 2,300 channels. Now we're getting opinion. But despite that bad news, the market doesn't respond in the way you and I do. 
we got to watch the events, not the market. They're two different things. So on came the 60s. Now we said, oh, this time it'll, it's okay now. Things will be better in the 1960s. It turned out to be one of those worst decades ever. Some of you recall, some of you have read. This is the first thing that happened in the 1960s. That wall was 97 miles long. It was made of barbed wire. The Soviets replaced it with concrete. The ground zero for the, for, the, for the Cold War was Berlin. This is the Berlin Wall. People were killed trying to get over that wall. Eastern Europe was blocked off from Western Europe. Imagine if that happened today, what would happen? What would, and anyone today my age in East Germany speaks Russian, not German. It was just devastating. It fractured Europe. Precipitated a bear market. Market's down 28% in 1961. Another bear market. 19, this is an interesting, 1962, John Kennedy was so young, we don't realize how young he was when he was president, John Kennedy was 43 years old when he was elected, 43, died at age 46. The Monroe Doctrine says you cannot have East, European or Eastern interference in the Western Hemisphere, it's the Monroe Doctrine. Fidel Castro spent 13 years in Mexico with Che Guevara and in Cuba training to take away the government from Juan Batista in Cuba. He had hardcore bad guys. If you showed up without a gun, you were sent home. If you didn't want to get in combat, you were sent home. If you stole something, you were, sat, you were killed. It was a hard, hard training, 13 years of that. And he came back and took over that government. Now understand, and I, I know you know this, let me remind you, Havana, Cuba is 99 miles from Miami. Less than 100 miles from Miami. Castro now takes the government. John Kennedy is convinced that he's going to set up a communist regime. Monroe Doctrine, you can't have a communist regime in the Western Hemisphere. So what did he do? John Kennedy invaded Cuba, if you remember, or if you've read about it. It's called the Bay of Pigs invasion. It failed. It scared Castro to death. So Khrushchev, being his ally, said, you know what? I'm going to send nuclear missiles to Cuba. And then they came steaming in in these ships, set up in silos in Cuba, aimed at every large American city. And Castro said to John Kennedy, because I kept Khrushchev in me. Khrushchev's an old guy. Kennedy's a young guy. He tried to bluff him. He said, if you so much as blink, I'm going to blow up every city in America and kill every American in the country. What's more significant, coronavirus or that threat? Putting that in perspective. Well, Kennedy didn't back down. He didn't blink. And on the 13th day, Khrushchev blinked. And we don't know to this day if it was prearranged or something they worked out behind the scenes or if it was real, but he backed down. We pulled our missiles out of Turkey. He pulled his missiles out of Cuba. Now we can breathe again. But the world for 13 days was on the brink of nuclear annihilation. The only time in American history we've gone to DEFCON 2 for the 46-year-old guy at the reins. So we get through it, and then this happened. John Kennedy, my mother's from Ireland, she cried for three days when Kennedy was killed. People were crying, they never heard, they didn't, around the world, the world was in mourning for John Kennedy. It was just unbelievable he was gone. Less than half the age of Gerald Ford. Outlived, uh, died before his parents. It was so bizarre. It was the weirdest thing we've ever seen. But it happened. And then in the 60s, that precipitated a bear market, down 22%. Why events? Is it, so what caused the market? Was it the market or was it John Kennedy's death? Was it the Cuban Missile Crisis? It's all the events surrounding it. 1967, the Six-Day War. Egypt, Syria, and Jordan attacked Israel with no provocation whatsoever, and Israel put that down in, 60, in six days. Now imagine Israel, which is the size of New Jersey, right? Size of New Jersey. If you put, if you put a match book, match book, in the middle of a football field, that's Israel surrounded by the Middle East. Put the entire, put it all down in six days. And if you do it again, we will reshape the Middle East. I mean, we were that close, again, to international war. That close in the 60s. And of course, Vietnam. My generation's war. The death rate, we, we spent eight years, some of you may have been there, some of you may remember this, discuss, in peace talks in Paris, discussing the shape of the tables. Anyone remember this? For eight years, we couldn't sit down at the table. The death rate in Vietnam, 150 boys a week for eight years. 57, 58,000 kids killed. What's more significant, coronavirus or Vietnam? How about this? In the space of five years, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X all assassinated in public. What would happen today if that, if that happened now? That kind of assassination of the top people in our country. It would tear this. We've all been there. We're the most resilient nation on earth. We've been there. We've survived all of this. And of course, it precipitated a bear market, down 36%. But 
But look what the Dow did at the end of the 1960s, the most tumultuous decade ever. And look how we got through it. At the, each one of these events is coronavirus. Each one of these events is 9-11. This time it's different. We lost a decade in the 1970s. The Dow was flat for 10 years. Why was it down? What was going on in the 1970s? Well, for one thing, we're in the midst of the Vietnam War, and Richard Nixon, by the way, the most beloved president ever at the time, probably. You may be too young to remember a lot of you, but Richard Nixon served longer than any other executive in United States history. He was on the ballot five times. He won three times as president and vice president. He took the isolation, took the Republican Party back from the isolationists. He opened trade war with China. He started affirmative action in this country. Nixon would be a Democrat today, probably, affirmative action guy. Beloved. But he's bombing Cambodia, Operation Menu, and lying about it. And one thing you don't do to the American public is lie to them. Americans cannot tolerate being lied to. It's just a national thing we have. And he did it. And it was just devastating in the 1970s. Caused the bear market when all this came out. Remember this? This is the Yom Kippur War. It's the payback for the Yom Kippur War. Anybody remember buying $2 worth of gasoline? Anybody remember standing in line on Wednesdays because we couldn't buy gas on the weekends? And the price of gas went through the roof and oil skyrocketed through the roof. That was the payback for the Yom Kippur War. We weren't even in it, but it was a good chance for the Middle East to blame us. Lebanon closed their embassy in Washington. Five, six country companies, countries pulled out of the United States, pulled their embassies out. We were in part of it. That was the 1970s. Of course, the worst stock market crash in 1929. We've forgotten that. Market was down 48%. It's down 28 now. It's down 48% in 22 months. Nixon resigned prior to impeachment. Left that day flashing the V sign. Remember this? 444 days, our, our embassy employees were in cap captured by Islamist students, one being Ahmadinejad from Iran. They were going to take the Soviet embassy. They had the last minute to take the American embassy. 444 days. We couldn't get him out of there. If you remember, the most salient moment in that whole time was a lot of American troops being killed in helicopters trying to go rescue them. And it was devastating. It cost Jimmy Carter the presidency. It was the end of Jimmy Carter, the beginning of Ronald Reagan. So the Soviets invaded Afghanistan nine years. That's their Vietnam. That was a Soviet's Vietnam for nine years, killed 100 Afghanis. It was a terrible, terrible war. And of course, we lost a decade. But we survived it. Well, along came the 80s. This, oh, the 80s would be fine. 80s would be much better. Well, who remembers 14? Anybody remember high mortgages in the 80s? 14% inflation. Anybody here have a mortgage back in the 1980s that remember? Mortgage rates got as high as 21%. I flew on a plane with a guy back in those days, stranger, met him on an airplane. He had built a 70,000 square foot medical building in Petaluma, California. He borrowed $5 million at 25%. He couldn't, he, it took him years to fill that building up, to, because doctors didn't have any money. If you recall, the stock market was down, bonds were off, bonds were no good because CDs were paying 16, 17%, real estate was down. We had three recessions in the first two years of the 80s, one of the most devastating economic times ever. Reagan let the interest rates run through the roof, inflation just took off. What did the purpose say? Another bear market. Here we go again, the bad news. Of course, Ronald Reagan, 69 days in office, shot. Here we go again. America has no stomach for this, but we got through it. This is the Achille Lauro. It's, a, it's an Italian cruise liner. It was invaded off the, off the coast of Greece by Palestinian terrorists, and they demanded that Israel release Palestinian hostages, or they're going to kill, start killing all the hostages. And do you, anybody remember? They did kill one American and threw his body in his wheelchair overboard. Anybody remember who that was? It was Leon Klinghoffer. He started with Leon Klinghoffer. His wife was there, his family, on a family crew, his family reunion. Killed him, threw his body over, overboard. Said, we're going to kill a passenger every hour until we get what we want. Of course, the United States, for the first time, said, we do not negotiate with terrorists. Terrorism is not new. We've been there since a long, long time ago. And they, these Palestinians realized that. They negotiated a flight away, which was intercepted by U.S. Navy jets. They were taken care of. But terrorism has been around for a long, long time in this country. That was the 1980s. What happened? Bear market. Market goes down, the market comes back. In fact, I want to ask you a third question. Randy said, the market comes down, comes back, sets new highs. Why do so many people lose? We know this is going to happen, but we can lose money every single time. People get destroyed. Cause why? Because fear is a bigger emotion than greed. Greed's big, fear is real big. In the 80s, Ronald Reagan, the most unpopular president in the history of the United States in a brief period of time because of the Iran-Contra affair. 
This was a, a deal cooked up by the administration to get Hezbollah to release Israeli hostages, to get money, to get guns in the hands of moderate Iranians, to get cash to Israel, and what was left over give to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Ronald Reagan denied, I said, I don't know anything about, I forget, I don't know anything about that. And of course, Oliver North had to testify. The truth came out. It was the biggest single drop in popularity of U.S. president in history. And of course, Reagan rebounded very well and retired when he left as a beloved guy. We invaded Panama to preserve the Panama Treaty, to cut down drug trafficking, to take out a bad guy, Noriega. We're, so we, we invaded a small country in the, in the 80s. And look what the Dow did. Now we're starting to take off. The three networks you and I, all, some of us grew up with, only three networks, ABC, NBC, uh, and uh, CBS. During the Iranian hostage crisis, Ted Turner, who was a very bright guy, said, you know what, there's a thirst for news in this country. And he founded CNN. That was founded shortly, I mean, followed shortly by Ted Koppel and Nightline. All of a sudden, we're getting 24 hours of news. So much information, we're losing our common sense. But along came the 90s. This is the first Gulf War. Get Iraq out of Kuwait, George H.W. Bush. Then came uh, civil war in Yugoslavia, the bloodiest war in Europe since World War II, brother killing brother, the Serbian war, the Croatian war, the Bosnian war, Clinton bombed Sarajevo, bloody, bloody battle, worst battle since World War II, rocked the world, the stock market hit it, press said, oh, this time it's different, this is ethnic cleansing, this is totally different. The coup in the Soviet Union, 1991, Gorbachev put that down in three days with tanks in Red Square, but he said, it was the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. The wheels are coming off now. This is a very tumultuous decade. Mexican currency crisis. Our neighbor to the south, their currency was completely devalued. It went for like two pesos to the dollar, to seven pesos overnight. We had the Clinton had to bail them out with money. It was an enormous event. Who remembers this guy? This guy's name was Timothy McVeigh. He and a guy named Terry Nichols were mad about Waco and Ruby Ridge and gun control, and they bombed the government's building, the Murtaugh building in Oklahoma City. Problem is, it was a daycare center in that building. And some of you will remember the picture of the fireman carrying that child who later died. In 1955, the Soviet soldiers, we weren't safe in our own beds. In 1995, Timothy Mivay said, your kids aren't safe in their beds. I'll kill your kids. The world is changing. What do we do? We rebounded and got through it. Soviets took the ruble, it was, it was pegged, they let it float, float freely, and the ruble just crashed. Over, every bond in the Soviet Union had issued defaulted. Of course, the President of the United States was impeached. What, this impeachment's not new. We've been there before. Remember this? Who remembers Y2K? Now we're getting real current. All of a sudden, at midnight on New Year's Eve 1999, ATMs are not going to work, factories are going to go dark, planes are going to fall out of the sky. It's Y2K. The press built this up to be the biggest event in the history of the world. Of course, it was a complete non-event. The market looked right through it. And look what the Dow did. We started at 198.89. All of a sudden, we're at 11,500, not too long after that. And we're starting to scream. And we get in it, it was a bear market. <laughs> Obviously, we had to have our, our typical bear market. Now we get into 2001 and 9-11, the most unprecedented act in history. Something, you know, the stickers to this day say, never forget. For a while, we were, when John Kennedy died, we were united as a nation. 9-11, we're all united. Now we're back to identity politics again. Bear market caused by 9-11, down 33%. So was it the market or was it 9-11? Hurricane Katrina, most expensive natural disaster in the history of this country. I know a lot of you remember that. Price of gasoline went through $4 in Ohio. I know, remember, a lot of you remember that. $5 in a lot of places. I live in Florida, it was almost $5. Of course, Saddam Hussein. The American public is so, we get so focused on the news, we lose total perspective. Do you all remember the Jay Leno show? Jay Leno used to do something called jaywalking. He'd go out at night and have a picture of a famous person. Do you anybody remember that? And he'd say, who's this? He took a picture of Saddam Hussein out in the street, said to a lady, who's this? And she said, Lionel Richie. It's the American, he asked a guy, he said, that's Carlos Santana. I mean, it's the American public. We got this. Bear market, of course. Real estate foreclosures. Ohio was hit really hard in 2008. Really hard. Of course, the crash of 2008. Market bottomed out in March of 2009. One of the worst disasters ever. 
complete f global uh, financial crisis that was precipitated. Bear market as a result of that, of course. The Dow, and we lost, uh, we, 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 we actually lost money that decade. 2010, I get real close now, European Union is, European Union is breaking apart. Brexit. Europe doesn't want, England doesn't want to carry Europe anymore. We're still in Afghanistan. Trump is now getting us out of there. That's the longest war in U.S. history. The longest war ever. 15-year war we fought in Afghanistan. That is um, Haiti. Never enough money. Haiti, we poured billions into Haiti. That's 2010. The market crashed in 2010. In five minutes, the Dow lost 1,000 points and came back. Down and back in five minutes. And we realized all of a sudden, this is not people doing this. This is, a, this is the machines. This is computers doing this. Basket trading, electronic trading. How fast can you get the trade out? And it triggered that precipitous drop, and we recovered from it. Unemployment at 9.9%. These are terrible, terrible years. Pigs is Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain all had to be bailed out. All those countries were going bankrupt had to be bailed out. The press at this time is, nothing has ever happened before. This is completely different. Remember the, the, the nuclear meltdown in Japan? Fukushima? Worse than Three Mile Island. Oh my God, a nuclear meltdown. This is going to change the world. This is different. The United States was downgraded for the first time in our history. Standard & Poor's downgraded the United States from AAA to AA and said it was political uh, brinksmanship that caused all of this. Too much political infighting. So all of a sudden we're no longer a first-rate power. Occupy Wall Street. People are very proud of saying overtly, we hate the United States. We hate this country. And they camped out, and it was just disgusting. But overt, overt, not afraid of it. They couldn't do that anywhere else in the world. You can get away with it. They had it here because they could get away with it. Harry Reid, John Boehner uh, from Ohio, and uh, Barack Obama worked out a deal just before, as Harry Reid said, we're going to drive the United States off a cliff, the fiscal cliff. Obama, Reid, and Boehner worked it out. That's Superstorm Sand, uh, Super Sandy. $800 million of damage just in New York City alone. Just ripped up the East Coast. Obamacare. This time it's different. Most expensive, contentious piece of legislation ever passed. Ever. Well, this, this is different. This is totally different. That's Detroit. Detroit at one time was the biggest city in America. It is to this day the ninth largest city in this country. It declared bankruptcy in 2013. So let that be a warning to Cleveland, Cincinnati, Atlanta, every city in the country. We had to shut down. We can't, we can't pay the cops. We can't pay the fire. We can't pay school teachers. We're bankrupt. The ninth largest city in America. What's worse, Obamacare, coronavirus, or Detroit going bankrupt? If we stand back and take a look, like we pass all, the government closed in 2003. The government shut down. It, it's so bizarre that that happened, but we're so used to crazy things. Okay, government shut down. It's bizarre. Of course, southern border problems in Arizona and Texas. Ebola virus, you all lived through that. and We all got through it. I think two or three people died in the United States. ISIS started a caliphate and killing tens of thousands of people in 20 different countries. Oh, they're going to be here in New York any day soon, the headline said in the New York Daily News. President of Crimea said, oh, we're going to be friendly to Europe. Crimea is right there. And, and of course, he didn't honor that. And the Soviets came in and annexed Crimea, away from Europe. A lot of Crimeans, a lot of Ukrainians would like to be and people in part of the Europe. They're not. That's um, civil unrest in Ferguson, Missouri. Civil unrest sweeping the nation. The Iran, the Iran nuclear deal. Did we give them nuclear, or did we put them closer or not? The jury's out. We don't know. I know we sent them $350 billion in cash, not to build a weapon. They don't seem to be honoring that. Millions of refugees streaming across Europe. 65 million refugees streaming, across, walking across Europe. 65 million. Of course, we're still in Syria all these years later, trying to get out now, as we speak, trying to get out of Syria. European Union Brexit finally happens in 2016. Trump won the election in 2016, went in office, had the Trump rally the following year. Of course, Russian hacking. Now, it's Russia, Russia, Russia since 2016. And, and we're going to go to nuclear war with North Korea. These events are monumental. Every one of these is a 9-11. Oh my God, this time it's different. Kim Jong-un said, I have missiles that can hit the United... I'm almost there. Almost got enough missiles to get the United... Enough power to get a nuclear missile to the United States. 
Of course, the emergence of China, the, this, is this China's century? Everyone says the United States is no longer the power. This is China's century, we shall see. Democrats won the House back in 2018, started a lot of problems for Mr. Trump. Uh, that's again the massing on the border in Juarez and, 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 and um, just south of San Diego. Can you think of the name of the city now? Uh, Tijuana. Massing on the border, Tijuana. Dow. Dow had a thousand point swings eight times in history. Five of them happened in 2018. December 2018 was one of the worst months ever. Of course, the government shut down again, so we're used to that this time. Uh, we're a trade war with China. Some love it, some hate it. We're in the middle of a trade war. Of course, the Russian investigation continues for three years. Donald Trump's impeached. Now it's coronavirus. So the only reason I show all of that is we got through it all. We've survived all of it, and we're going to survive coronavirus. No one knows where it's going. I, God knows what's going to happen. It's in 100 countries right now. There have been 133,000 cases, 4,900 4, people dead. We don't know where it's going to go, but I know we're going to get through it. I know the United States will survive it. So I was going to make it just a few, couple, few more points to give us back to Randy. Coronavirus is a scary name. Corona, the spikes, it's a scary because it spikes. They look like crowns. This is the seventh strain of coronavirus we've had. This is not new. Of the previous six, four were very harmless. SARS was not and MERS was not. They were deadly. SARS had a death rate of 10%. MERS had a death rate of 40%. Coronavirus in the 1% to 3% range. Spanish flu. 20 million people died. 500,000 died in America. But look, the market was down 25% in 1918. Is that because of Spanish flu or is it because of the end of World War I? It's always mitigating circumstances. Following year, it came right back, it's up 10%. Asian flu, 1957. 70,000 dead in the United States. Market's up 24%. We've weathered viruses before. These are all deadly viruses. Bird flu, which never came to the United States. Not one case reported in the United States. But you, the press, you think, oh, this is it. Bird flu's coming everywhere. And the market was up 32%. Swine flu, 22 million, uh, 22,000, 20 million cases, 4,000 dead in the United States. Market's up that year, 23%. A year later, it's up 12%. SARS, only 8,000 people got SARS, but the death rate was, was 40%. And the market was down 13%. It was up 20% after that, three months later. So down 13%, th minute it hit, three months later, up 22%. What was going on at the same time? The tech bubble was bursting. MERS, only 173 deaths. Market was up 13%. So we've been through all these viruses before. Of the 15 pandemics that came prior to this to coronavirus, an epidemic is when something spreads rapidly, a pandemic when it spreads in a, globally through a country or all around the world. Coronavirus is now officially a pandemic. It's spreading around the world. Of the 15 prior times this has happened, stocks are back three months after it hits. Right back to normal and, climb, not been, and climbing again. Hopefully it'll happen again. On average, the stock price is up 10% a year later. So everything, it's every time in the past, we shall see. So I just want to remind you in closing, here's what you've been forced to deal with in, in the last 20 years. And I don't know if you remember these, remember the impact, but these are all headlines in the last 20 years. 1999, the end of the world. That was Y2K. Look at the Time Magazine cover. The end of the world. There was only one end of the world. That wasn't it, actually, but they thought it was. In 2002, West Nile virus. Remember that name? Remember West Nile virus? And then in 2003, it was SARS. In 2005, it was avian flu, death threat. Never came to the United States. It's on the cover of Time Magazine because that sells a lot of magazines. 2006, E. coli. I'm sure you all remember what Chipotle went through in 2006. 2008, Paul Krugman said, we're going into a depression. That was at the very bottom of the market. He wrote this book, won a Nobel Peace Prize. And the market went exactly the opposite way after he wrote the book and took off and started screaming. 2009, swine flu, New York Daily News. 2013, we're on high alert because Korea is going to start lobbing nukes at the United States. This time it's different. 2014, Ebola. Was the big scare in 2014, 2015, ISIS. That's the head. Look at the New York Daily News. ISIS will be here soon. What does that do for the people in New York City to read that? ISIS is coming to your neighbor is probably an ISIS person. Time Magazine 2016, Zika, the Zika virus. This has been it's nonstop. So what we're seeing right now, this is just short-term volatility. 
I'd love you to imagine as this market goes lower and lower and lower, we're pushing a beach ball underwater. And we're holding it down, and we're holding it down, and we're holding it down, and you know very well what happens when we let go. The further we push it down, the higher it goes when we let go. And so we're pushing a beach ball underwater right now. Another analogy I'll have is tuna fish is on sale. If tuna fish and mentor is $1.50 a can, and Saturday morning we go to the grocery store and it's 99 cents a can, we're going to buy five cans of tuna fish. Because that's the way people shop. We buy things on sale. The Carver Financial Advisors are in the only business in the world. They slash their prices, people run away. Why? Because investing is counterintuitive. It's really hard to invest. Randy doesn't manage money as much as he manages expectations and emotions. Warren Buffett said it best that he said, is, I just lose the mic a little bit? I don't even need this. How's that? We okay? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You want to look at it? Warren Buffett said the key to investing is to get greedy when other folks get fearful. And to get fearful when other folks get greedy. So are people fearful now or greedy? They're fearful. So it's time to get greedy. It's really, really hard to do. That's why people need a financial advisor, among other things, because it's really hard emotionally to invest money and not get caught up. I've been using this. I've been using this too. I guess I should use this too, shouldn't I? Okay, thank you. Mike, oh, this is not too loud. So tuna fish is now a 99 cents a can. We got to start buying. We can start investing our money like we buy tuna fish. I try to urge people, when you invest your own money, you start paying attention. And you read a lot of newspapers, you watch a lot of TV, go on the internet a lot, and you see words that scare you to death. There's no such thing as reasonable discourse anymore. If you go on Twitter, everything's high voltage disdain and scorn, and, and, and it's, it's, it's outrage. So if you want to get someone's attention, you really got to amp up the volume. And that's what these words do. They amp up the dangers. And we're all victims of these words. Market plunges 1,000 points. Market soars 2,000 points. Well, how would you feel? To, just think tomorrow morning, you're going to go downtown Cleveland, get on an elevator. It's not going to say up or down. It's going to say soar or plunge. What would you do? You get off the elevator. Like, you get out. Just words. The market soars means up. Plunges means down. It's just words. And lastly, one of the things I'm going to talk about is being properly diversified. When your money's properly diversified, you should own stuff that makes you uncomfortable. Because it's no different than, I'm the, I use the analogy, three lanes of traffic. If you're in traffic like this and things are slowing down, what's your first inclination, of course, when your lane stops? Change lanes. What happens the minute you get in the other lane? What does your lane do and that lane do? That one stops, yours goes. Everyone's going to get to the toll booth eventually. The idea is to be invested in all three lanes of traffic. That's all diversification is. It's just being invested. And I, I try to explain to people, um, I, in fact, we were, I was talking about it with a fellow, and he said, I don't really understand diversification. And I turned to his wife and said, how many pairs of shoes do you own? <laughs> she said, like 52 pairs of shoes. I said, tell your husband why. I said, listen up, this is diversification. You don't wear black with everything. You have winter shoes. You invest your money like you buy shoes. So how do we react? What are we doing here? Avoid rash reactions. Take a deep breath, step back, talk to your advisor, do nothing rash. See if your plan's on track. You want this back? See if your assets are diversified properly. And um, talk about Roth conversions. Thank you. Do you have cash? That, just sit down with your advisor right now. Do nothing rash. Just sit down and focus on long-term investing. Have a long-term time horizon. What Randy and these advisors set up for you is decades. This coronavirus now is a month old. We're talking decades. Decades. Don't try to time the market. Problem with timing the market, you've got to be right twice, and that's impossible to do over time. You've got to know when to buy and when to sell. Diversify properly. Have a realistic time horizon. And set realistic expectations. And lastly, every country has obsessions that are very particular to that culture. The United States frets about three things. Our own health, our personal safety, and money. Those are three biggies in America. And any time, thank you. It's very common to worry about our money, our health, and our safety. The media knows that. So if you, that's, they, that's why stories on the front page are always about 
health, safety, or money. Nothing else. There's no more news. I watch Fox News. There's no more, there's no more news on Fox News. It's breaking news. Fox News alert. Everything's a news alert. Why? It gets your attention. They're trying to get your attention. It's the dark side of strong conviction. I want you to watch me. So that's good for the bottom line of the media. It's not good for our peace of mind. So as much as you can, be open to uncertainty and let life happen. Because what's going to happen is going to happen. And we will get through it. I've been, Randy said 45 years. That was kind. I've been doing this 53 years. And every single time I've been on it, it's been, oh, my Lord, this is it. This is the big one. And every single time we get through it. So there's the Dow in my lifetime, or actually a little less than my lifetime. So those are my comments. I thank you for your time here. I thank you for your time, people watching online. I hope that was of some help anyway, being informative. So thank you all very much. So. Thanks, Tom. I'd like to thank everybody for watching. Everybody's situation's unique. So call us, call your advisor. We're happy to discuss it. Uh, Bobby, your advisor will discuss it. Things are going to be scary, and they may get worse before they get better. But as Don said, it's certainly not different this time. So thank you very much.